life on Earth wouldn't exist without our oceans. Serving as a home to 80% of all living things, a source of livelihood for millions of communities around the globe, and a treasure trove of scientific discoveries just waiting to be made. Our oceans sustain us all. But at the same time, our use of the seas has often been short-sighted and detrimental. And today, we're starting to realize that what we do next will make or break our oceans. To address the crises that the marine world faces, everyone needs to be on board. Environmentalists, engineers, policymakers, and each and every person here today. We need approaches that combine people, ideas, and the natural world in new ways to create the most sustainable change possible. And that's where you come in. By bringing together experts from all different fields of science, business, and policy, Blueprint hopes to inspire you with stories of marine conservation today so that you'll rise to the challenge of designing the solutions of tomorrow. Ultimately, your innovations could make waves as we take on the task of protecting our big blue planet. So, whether you're just getting your feet wet or have been immersed in the world of conservation for a while, we hope you're ready to dive into this weekend. Thanks for joining us and welcome to Blueprint. All right. Hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Jason Wang. And on behalf of the Blueprint team and Duke Conservation Tech, I'd like to thank you and welcome you to Blueprint 2019, Oceans Plus Innovation. I've had the great fortune of being one of Duke Conservation Tech's co-presidents this year. And I've seen firsthand how hard everyone on the team's worked ever since the very moment the last Blueprint Conference ended, actually, in order to bring back an amazing and inspiring and a memorable event for all of you here tonight. Do Conservation Tech as a club is dedicated towards applying technology to some of the most critically important conservation challenges of our era. And we started Blueprint three years ago in order to expand this idea beyond our members inside our clubs to a wider community because we decided and we knew that everyone should be involved and should be ensuring that we have a healthier future for our friends, for our families, and for our planet. And so we are super proud to join this forward-thinking group of engineers, of innovators, and of policymakers that will make up the next generation of the conservation community. But before I dive in, I would like to first introduce and welcome Dean Toddy Steelman of the Nicholas School of the Environment here at Duke. And as she joins me on stage, I want to thank her and the Nicholas School for all of the work that they've done and all of the support that they've given to Blueprint. Blueprint would not have existed today without your help and without your support. And so on behalf of Blueprint, all the students, participants, experts, mentors, and everyone here, I want to thank you for all of your support. Yeah, thank you. Um, hypoxic dead oceans and dead spots in our oceans, we all know that our marine and ocean environments uh, are facing a bit of a crisis. So now more than ever is a great time for us to be thinking about what we can do in new and innovative ways to address these key challenges. And I am very proud of the fact to be dean of a school where we have nearly 75 faculty um, <clears throat> or doctoral students who are actively engaged in addressing these key challenges. Um, these 75 faculty and students collaborate with over 200 other university labs, government and intergovernmental agencies, nonprofit organizations, and industry partners as part of a global network of marine innovators. And you all are going to tap into that over the next couple of days, and I think that's a really exciting proposition. <clears throat> Time will not permit me to tell you about all of the stuff that we have going on in the Nicholas School, um, but I did want to highlight three particular individuals and areas. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm getting over the, this cold that's been going around. Um, Dave Johnson is down at our marine lab. You may or may not know, but uh, the Nicholas School has a marine lab down in Beaufort. Um, and Dave Johnson and his team uh, at our marine robotics and remote sensing lab are using a variety of remote controlled drones 
uh, many of which they build on site or customize on site um, to revolutionize the way we do marine research. If you haven't had a chance to go down there and check this out, it's well worth it. Um, the beauty of these drones is that they enable us to collect a large amount of data uh, on demand in remote areas uh, or dangerous areas that otherwise we would not be able to. Um, and they can do it at a finer scale and at much lower costs than you can with a satellite uh, or a plane. So Dave and his team, which includes doctoral, masters, and undergraduate students, have used their drones to do a whole variety of things, including analyzing marine debris on remote islands in the Pacific and the Atlantic, to do population counts of gray uh, seals, sea turtles, and other species off the waters of North America, Antarctica, and Central America, map and measure storm erosion right off the coast of North Carolina, uh, especially this year after Hurricane Florence. So they've been out there doing some post-Florence analysis, which has been really, they were able to report back almost live as that right after Florence happened to tell us what was happening down at the coast, and that was really exciting for us. His team, Dave's team, also works to develop and test new technologies that expand drones' capabilities. Um, and some of the cool things that they are doing is that they're using 3D printing technology to make low-cost drones that are programmable and can be equipped with cameras. So they're doing this all right down in Beaufort. They also have developed a hybrid drone that's a combination um, of a fixed-wing craft that gives it stability and a multi-rotor craft that basically gives it uh, maneuverability. And that enables them to fly longer missions and to launch and recover the drones while at sea. So some pretty cool stuff that's happening down there. The second example that I just like to talk about is Pat Halpin. Pat, wave your hand. Yes, thank you. Pat and his team at the Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab are using geospatial mapping technologies and remote sensing to create all sorts of new tools um, that monitor and in many cases really can begin to help predict and even prevent harmful human impacts in the marine environment. And a big part of uh, his lab's focus is in getting these tools as quickly as possible into the hands of regulatory agencies, environmental managers, and industry and watchdog groups who can make a difference in terms of putting that knowledge to use. So this year alone, Pat and his group have introduced three new different management tools, and I just want to tell you about those very briefly. The first is a model that automatically, um, uh, that that automates the identification of systems data to track the movement of deep sea fishing vessels in international waters. And by doing so, he can, their team can basically monitor illegal and unreported and unregulated uh, fishing activity there. The second is a statistical framework that helps regulators identify ecologically significant areas across the sea floor that should be placed off limits for future deep sea mining. And this is a really pressing issue right now. And they are clearly at the cutting edge and the forefront of dealing with some of these issues. And finally, the third tool is a model that can predict the movements of deep sea fishing boats. And so they do this on a month by month basis to understand where those boats are, giving agencies advance warning of where they think those boats are going to be. And then, then they know when endangered species are in those same areas, birds, turtles, or other species, um, that could be ensnared or killed by those fishing lines. So by matching and doing a bit of a gap analysis there, they're able to be a little bit more proactive and try to avoid some of those problems. The final example is Doug, Doug Novacek. Doug is back there too. Hey, Doug. Um, and the students in his acoustics and engineering lab, they're just back from uh, a trip that they took off the coast where they were doing a lot of work. And they're developing new technologies for understanding the use uh, of sound by marine mammals and so that they can protect those marine mammals, the, the potentially harmful impacts that those sounds have from excessive underwater noise. Um, so his work and his lab's work involves very close collaboration with folks in the Pratt School of Engineering. Um, and there are, just a, there are a few things that I'll mention that he's been working on. Uh, Non-invasive tagging technologies that can collect all sorts of data from marine mammals underwater without posing harm to those animals. New signals for military ships that can reduce the amplitude of sonar, thereby reducing the damage to marine mammals. And most recently, a best practices guide for reducing the harmful impacts of underwater noise. So not just doing the research, but creating a guide that can put into practice 
um, and widely shared with governance, governments and energy companies worldwide so that they can take advantage of that science and that knowledge. And within the Nicholas School, <clears throat> we are investing more into these respective areas uh, so that we might have a greater impact at this day and age when we most need it. And this includes the construction of a brand new ocean engineering lab down at our marine lab, uh, funded through a recent gift from the Granger Family Descendants Fund. And so we're very excited about that, and there are new things that will be coming down at the marine lab as well. So in conclusion, um, I hope this serves as just a little bit of inspiration for the disruptive innovation that you all will be engaged in here for the next couple of days. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it back, back over to Jason. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dean Steelman. And so it's very clear that we are partnered with amazing organizations. But I would also like to um, thank all of our sponsors. And so in addition to the Nicholas School of the Environment, I'd like to thank the Pratt School of Engineering here at Duke University. I'd like to thank the Duke Student Government. And I'd also like to thank the Duke Program in Innovation and Entrepreneurship for all of their contributions. I also want to thank our corporate sponsors. So I want to thank National Geographic, Conservation X Labs, the Schmidt Marine Technology Partners, Microsoft, and Google. And all of their contributions have made it possible for us to invite an amazing panel of speakers here tonight. So I'd like to invite and introduce Virginia Pan, who is a junior studying at the Duke Marine Lab in Beaufort, North Carolina. And yeah. And joining her on stage will be our amazing five panelists, Dr. Andrew Thaler, Dr. Jonathan Giddens, Topher White, Ted Janulis, and Dr. Winnie Lau. Please join me in a round of applause. Thank you, Jason. Hi, my name is Virginia Pan, and I'm a junior uh, here at Duke University. I'm actually studying at the Duke Marine Lab this semester and came up for the weekend to host this amazing panel and come to this amazing conference. Um, here at Duke, I'm majoring in electrical and computer engineering and doing a certificate in marine science. And I'm really interested in combining these two fields to make exploration technologies that we can use to learn more about our oceans, to better conserve and protect them. Um, I just want to say a couple words about this year's theme. So our theme this year is Oceans Plus Innovation. And you might be wondering, why did we pick this theme? Um, I'm going to give you two reasons why. So the first reason is we don't know a lot about our oceans. Our oceans cover 70% of our planet, and yet we have only explored a mere 5%. So there's a huge part of Earth that we don't know what's there, and we are harming it at rates uh, that are just unsustainable. So that brings me to my second point, in that our oceans face really dire problems right now, from climate change to plastic pollution. Um, there's a whole host of ocean problems um, that our panelists are going to talk about. However, there's also room for innovative solutions in order to, I guess, break free from these problems and allow us to use the oceans in a more sustainable way. So that's a little bit about our theme. And now I'm going to introduce our um, first panelist, Dr. Andrew Thaler. Um, he went here for Duke undergrad, actually, and did his PhD at the Duke Marine Lab. Uh, he is founder and CEO of Blackbeard Biological, an environmental consulting firm that looks at ocean innovation technology and education. In addition, he writes one of the most widely read um, websites about marine science education called uh, Southern Fried Science. Please link, help me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Thaler. All right, well, thank you so much, and I'm, I'm very excited to see all of the incredible projects that uh, you will have uh, tomorrow. Uh, so I want to talk about two projects that I've worked on in the last few years that are a little bit serious, and one project that's a lot silly. Uh, and, but before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about how I got here. Uh, I'm a deep sea ecologist, a population geneticist, and a conservation technologist. But most of my work revolves around human impacts in the deep sea, particularly around 
deep sea mining uh, and the management and mitigation of the impact of removing something like a hydrothermal vent using a giant underwater robot. So uh, a lot of my professional work is not so much marine technology, but in how we prevent marine technology from significantly altering our seafloor. Um, and working in the deep sea is uh, a tremendous privilege. Um, it's an incredible environment. It's perhaps the most remote ecosystem on the planet. It's certainly one of the most difficult to access. And because of that, it's out of reach and out of mind of almost everybody uh, who lives on the planet. Uh, most people have no real conception of the deep sea. Most people uh, don't really think about the deep sea in their day-to-day -day lives or how their actions can impact that. Uh, and that's really a shame because it is uh, a tremendously biodiverse, a tremendously uh, surprising uh, world. And in a lot of ways, when we make new discoveries in the deep sea, it fundamentally changes our understanding of life on Earth. Uh, particularly at places like hydrothermal vents, which are absolutely amazing. Um, but because it's very difficult to get people to interact with the deep sea, one of the things I want to do is build technologies that help people connect better uh, with the ocean. And one of those technologies is um, this little guy right here. This is my favorite robot in the world. This is the Open ROV. The Open ROV is a low-cost, open-source, underwater robot. Um, that's used for science, it's used for education, it's used for exploration. Um, and we have gone all over the world building these robots, teaching students how to build robots, teaching students how to operate robots, how to use them as scientists use robots in the deep sea. These are, um, in addition to being incredibly fun tools, they're also serious pieces of scientific equipment. And you can conduct studies using these robots uh, just as you would using a giant uh, deep sea ROV that you'd be using to study a hydrothermal vent. So it's a tremendous tool for, for getting people to connect with the ocean and getting people to understand how we study the deep sea. But it's also an incredibly portable, incredibly uh, utilitarian platform uh, that really works anywhere. So I have this vision. Um, I didn't create the Open ROV. I'm the uh, staff ecologist for the company. Uh, and the Open ROV really opened my eyes to the potential for ocean technology. Um, so that was sort of my crash course in understanding how these tools work. But uh, the vision of Open ROV is that anyone can be an explorer, anyone can be a scientist, and you don't need uh, capital research grants. You don't need major sources of funding. You don't need access to huge institutions. You can do things like mount uh, a deep sea expedition over the Mariana Trench using uh, a traditional Polynesian voyaging canoe and an underwater robot that the students on the, on the voyaging canoe built themselves. So it's tremendously useful for things like that. Um, Open ROV inspired me to develop my own open source project. This is the Open CTD. Uh, a CTD is an oceanographic instrument uh, that allows you to measure salinity, temperature, and depth. So you can take a water column profile. Those are incredibly important measurements for doing pretty much any kind of analysis of ocean health or understanding things happening in the ocean. Anytime you go on a research expedition, you uh, need to take measurements that you would do with a CTD. It's also an incredibly expensive piece of equipment. And when I was a postdoc, we needed these tools, and we didn't have the funds to get these tools. And so we decided to figure out if there was a way to build a cheaper one uh, and to deploy it. And so we now have um, this fully open source oceanographic instrument that you can build for uh, $300. Um, and you know, these, these two projects are really uh, important. They're also a little bit whimsical. They have this, this broader vision of connecting people to the ocean. Um, I, I want to end on, on one final project, which is a very silly project. Uh, this is Dolphin View. Uh, this is a uh, LiDAR array strapped to my face that connects to bone conducting headphones uh, and allows you to see the world in a way that a marine mammal might by projecting a signal out and having it bounce off objects and then conducting that signal back in through your jawbone. Um, it is a, a ridiculously silly silly thing. It's a lot of fun to get students to do it, to have them walk around the classroom with their eyes closed trying to see doors and everything. Um, it's really fun, but I, I wanted to highlight this one because um, this, this weekend we're going to hear a lot about big problems in the ocean. We're going to hear a lot about little problems in the ocean too. We're going to hear about all the different projects and the problems in the ocean. We're going to hear about uh, resource limitations and how that affects how we can triage and decide how to fix ocean problems. But the one resource that's not really limited is uh, human creativity. And you know, there's thousands of people, millions of people working to fix ocean problems. And if everyone 
uh, does just a little bit to make the ocean just a little bit better, you'd be amazed how far we can get. Uh, so thank you. to the stage. Uh, Jonathan is a marine ecologist and National Geographic Fellow that is using drop cam technology to explore the deep sea. She also combines science, art, and storytelling in order to further human nature connections. Okay. Thank you everybody for having me and I'm very excited to be here and speak with you today um, about our research project with National Geographic Exploration Technology labs using deep ocean drop cams to explore the deep ocean. And before I get into the technology and the research project, I just want to tell you a short personal story that illustrates what drives me in, in my work with ocean conservation. And the answer is experiencing places like this in this picture. This is a picture of Elgal on, on the Highlands of Scotland, in the, so it's the Isle of Skye and the Highlands of Scotland. And this picture I drew when I was 17 years old, and it was the day that I banished cameras from my life. I said, these are just a distraction from me actually experiencing the place. So what happened was, it was my first trip overseas, and being a new tourist, I thought that as a tourist, we're supposed to just take pictures of everything. And so I tried to do that, and it was exhausting, and I wasn't, I felt a disconnect between what I was looking at um, through the lens of a camera. And so finally, when we got to Elgal, the very last stop of the day in the Isle of Skye, my camera ran out of batteries. And instead of thinking, oh, I'll go and change the batteries, I thought, oh, thank God, now I don't have this distraction in front of me, and I can actually just really absorb the place. And so over the next couple of days, I drew these pictures of Elgal, and it really kind of became alive in me. Um, so even though I had banished cameras and I thought be, art is the only way to experience the world, I was very wrong because I set that up as a dichotomy, either one or the other. But there was a truth that I found that day when I threw my drawings with nature. And that truth is that drawing is a process that makes me focus my attention and makes me engage with the place very deeply. And so now, cameras are the hero of the story. So we're using these deep ocean drop cameras that National Geographic Society developed to explore all over the world into the deep ocean. Um, like was mentioned, only 5% of the ocean has been explored, and so these cameras can go where we've never seen before. And so I'll show you a little clip about how they work. So they're untethered, which makes them very portable, and they're weighted, and they're, they drop down to the bottom of the seafloor this, with this weight, and they have their own lights to light up the scene. So this scene is um, from the East Pacific, and this is a couple, a couple hundred meters down, which is way, way below diving depth. So these are very delicate ecosystems that we otherwise would not have been able to see. Um, and these delicate ecosystems that are out of sight are facing all these challenges that could silently go extinct from all the uh, human impacts of climate change, um, deep sea mining, all these disturbances. And so this video footage, um, we can see all, all these places that we never had been able to see before. So what, these cameras are programmed to record for a number of hours, and then when they're done recording, they drop their weight and they go up to the, um, to the surface and they send a radio signal and they're picked up by the ship. And so what's amazing how portable and robust they are, they've already been deployed 24 times and counting around the Earth from the Russian Arctic to Antarctica was the most recent expedition, mostly with National Geographic's pristine seas expeditions. Um, and so what I do with the video footage is we're, um, we're constructing a global database, a global index of biodiversity of the deep sea, and so this is just looking at a couple of different measures of biodiversity, one for each panel, 
um, for a subset of sites in the eastern tropical Pacific, which shows that the Galapagos in green um, are emerging as more, more diverse than the other areas. So this is just a snippet of what we're going to be doing for this global database to assess biodiversity in the deep sea. So now cameras are windows into nature instead of being a distraction. Um, but the exploration process does not stop with being a number on a graph. Art is still a way to engage more deeply with these sea creatures or with these, with these uh, places. And so one way of, um, of engaging and also sharing that experience is with Open Explorer, National Geographic's um, digital field journal that anybody can, for your projects, maybe this weekend you think of your projects you want to open up and start telling people, open up an expedition and open explore and start telling people about your story. And so I've been uh, putting drawings of the deep sea here and it's called Into the Deep. So you can follow us on our expedition there and you can start your own. And um, I guess the moral of the story of bringing it back is that technology and art can uh, work together to help us see further than anyone could do alone. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, our next panelist is Topher White. Uh, Topher is a National Geographic Explorer and founder and CEO of the nonprofit startup. Hey guys, um, so you're here to talk about oceans and innovation. I'm gonna uh, make a quick plea in, in defense of why we should talk about rainforests in, uh, in, um, uh, in that sort of same context. Oh, let me take it back to the, to the actual talk. And... Um, so, who thinks there's a relationship between what happens in the rainforest and what happens in the ocean? All right, you guys are there, okay. Basically, um, climate change is one of the biggest threats to the sea we see to the ocean. And if you look at uh, what actually causes uh, climate change around the world, uh, it turns out that uh, deforestation, destruction of forest, is the second largest contributor to climate change, more than all the transportation, all the cars, trucks, ships, planes combined. None of that adds up to the carbon uh, emissions from deforestation. And illegal logging actually makes up to 90% uh, of the uh, activities in the tropical forest. Um, and it's actually so much worse than that because illegal logging is so profitable that they'll go in there, that's what creates these roads, and once you see uh, a road it's there, that road actually leads to the wholesale destruction of the forest. So well, that logging is what creates the roads, those roads are what destroys the forest, and that destruction of forest is what uh, is causing up to a fifth of climate change around the world, which is uh, affecting everything. There's a lot of technology being built to try and stop this, uh, you know, drones, satellites, drones are like a solution to everything, um, lots of other sorts of things, but uh, none of this is actually a real-time solution to help people stop it. Um, and so here's a solution that, uh, that we work on. The moment the chainsaw goes off in the forest, the sound is picked up by devices in the trees. It transmits through the cloud uh, to send an alert to local rangers who can like, jump on their motorcycles and get out there and stop people on the spot in this perfectly realistic rendition of um, what happens out there. Um, but for this, you do kind of need uh, you know, people in the field and then technology to make it happen. The rainforest, just like the oceans, is pretty remote. Technology that works here or in cities doesn't work out there. So you have to use stuff that actually is adapted. Well, what's out there in the forest? Because we're not just talking about measurement, we're talking about actually stopping it. Um, well, there's people, uh, and these sort of animated rangers are not just uh, a fantasy. They really are out there and getting their work done. And there's actually connectivity, uh, whether it be the oceans or the forest, on the, on the perimeter. There's areas, there's pretty good areas of connectivity. And so to build that, why not use old cell phones? You know, they're thrown away by the hundreds of millions every year. Uh, you can put them into a nice box to protect them from, be it water uh, and rain, uh, or, uh, or the rain uh, of the forest. And, uh, and you can put solar panels so they can last for years with a powerful microphone. And then you can pretty much have this, uh, this pretty awesome uh, little contraption. This is me putting uh, one of the first ones together in a garage, also um, realistic speeds. And this is one of them up on a tree. Um, and this one device that's up there, we talk about climate change, the destruction of the forest contributes so much. So one of these things up in the field is three square kilometers of forest protected from chainsaws and other activities, just based on the, the range that one can have, um, which is like 15,000 tons of carbon, which is 3,000 cars off the road for a year. Like the impact of protecting forests is just super outsized. Um, also, there's really cute animals in the forest. This is objectively one of the cutest, not one of the, the cutest animal lives, a baby um, taper. Um, yeah, there's lots of those. Okay, so uh, our technology <laughs> is, uh, is deployed all over the world. We've been at this for a few years, 10 countries, uh, five uh, continents, and 2,000 square kilometers of forest, which is uh, still very conservative compared to what we'd like to do. Um, and this is what that actually looks like, because every single one of these projects involves partnerships and understanding of the local context. So we're going to talk about Brazil, um, one of our biggest projects. 
This is actually, if you go back, you can see um, Brazil is like this ocean of deforestation <laughs> with, uh, with like uh, just a few pockets of actually intact forest. Uh, this is one of those. These are not actually traditional protected areas. These are um, uh, indigenous territories. Um, this red line is the Tembe territory. It's about 2,500 square kilometers of forest. And uh, this is the Tembe. Um, this entire purple area uh, in 2014, when we first met them, was controlled by illegal loggers, settlers, drug cartels, who completely uh, occupied almost 90% um, of their forest. Um, and for them, it's like existential threat. They're just trying to survive, and this land is controlled by, uh, by their enemies. Um, so just driving from one town to the next, can we get the sound up? From one town to the next, oh yeah. Uh, you can actually, they would come up. They would come across these like, you know, big, big trucks, like 10 trucks at a time, industrial scale, black market logging, just, uh, just taking it out. It's very dangerous for them. Uh, and so this clearly was a threat they had to address. So with that in mind, uh, the Tembe uh, got their youngest people together. They um, armed them and turned them into a police force to protect the area, but it's a really big area. So, you know, we're talking like 2,500 square miles with 30 rangers. Uh, so that's where this, um, this technology uh, element comes into it. So we teamed up with them. These are actually uh, cell phone towers, uh, but they, you know, that's a good 20 kilometers from the perimeter. Uh, and so trying to make that work was kind of a big deal. So for that, um, we actually taught the Tenbe to, um, to, uh, to actually build these things uh, themselves, because we're talking old cell phones exactly. and solar panels. You want to put the microphone on there. Uh, and, uh, and then to get that connectivity pretty far away, uh, we actually taught them to climb trees available to almost anybody uh, as well. All the time. So in this case, I uh, climbed up about 150 really feet up really in a tree, really taught the Tenbe how to do it. From there, you can pick up cell service super sound. far away. They can do all this great processing. Uh, and uh, pretty good um, the hard parts, of course, uh, light have to do with too, like making pretty good sunlight. to power them. So uh, and making with sure they this sort of installation up there in Tenbe territory, but all these are things we're able to pick up uh, with pretty chainsaw sounds. sounds. Cool. Uh, people come on to cut the trees up to a kilometer, a kilometer half away. So this whole idea of, you know, when a chainsaw goes off in the forest, it goes up through the cloud, it sets off an alert to those rangers who get it. That cloud element is pretty important. That's where AI comes into it. Um, and a lot of what you'll see is about sort of collecting data from the forest and from, uh, from the oceans, and how do you actually analyze that? It's a pretty important part. So in our case, um, can we turn this out up? Uh, this is uh, sort of uh, our example of our, our um, interfaces. So this is a chainsaw. You guys can hear the chainsaw, right? Uh, so this is a pretty obvious one. This is a test, right? But uh, the same Tembe territory, we're talking very, very large areas. Here is uh, one actually from the field. You guys probably can't see the chainsaw quite as much, uh, but this is an example where people themselves couldn't hear it, but our AI was able to pick it out. Uh, these sorts of alerts are what allows the Tembe to respond uh, in real time. Uh, as you see here, uh, to be actually get out there and actually catch the trucks as they are. Uh, and then a typical example with Tembe involves uh, them being able to seize that truck either on its way in, if we're lucky, or on its way out. Um, they will then, in some cases, you know, uh, take matters in their own hands, burn the trucks, uh, stop the illegal logging operations, and it's been very, very effective. So um, they actually become the protectors of the land because this, like the oceans, are areas where there's no law enforcement really to, uh, to make a difference. So the people who are already there, they can make a, a big difference, and we actually rely upon them to do it. Just this one, these, this one ranger, you know, he can have more effect than, like, two dozen engineers at Tesla on climate change just by uh, doing what they do. Um, and for that in mind, we also want to get everyone else involved. So we have uh, so some apps to allow you to stream like real-time sounds from the forest. So like, for example, this is a live feed from Ecuador right now. But all over the, all over the world, you can kind of listen to it. So download our app from here. Um, and it's not just about stopping chainsaws either, because like you just heard that there's some pretty awesome stuff happening out there. Bioacoustics, something that was almost pioneered in the oceans, has now become really helpful in understa understanding forests as well. So um, for example, these are the web interfaces that we build. Uh, this is um, you know, being able to, can you turn the sound up on this? I'll hide over here. Anyway, so the acoustics of the forest are so exciting. Um, and uh, with AI and with these cool tools, we're able to actually automate the ecological studies in the forest. So here we're able to say, oh, there's a vehicle passing by, that's a given, these are insects and all the rest. And putting these tools in front of ecologists and biologists, uh, for us, is pretty exciting. We hope that we can uh, actually discover some cool things about the forest just using this system that we really invented for stopping illegal logging. Um, and then at the end of the day, 
you know, yes, we have this uh, device that, uh, that has solar panels and microphones, but at the end of the day, it's really just a phone. Uh, hopefully, we can get out of the hardware business altogether, just use some of the old phones that are out there, and that's really the future uh, for us. So rainforest connection, we are working on protecting forests, uh, we're protecting oceans by protecting forests, and uh, check us out. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Topher. Our next panelist is Ted Janulis. Um, he is a senior advisor at the Constellation Research and Technology Firm. Uh, he provides analytics and advising for sustainable investment by combining his years in finance with his passion for the ocean. He is also a former president of the Explorers Club and uh, currently serves on the Nicholas uh, School for the Environment Board of Visitors. Please uh, join me in welcoming Ted to the stage. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Can you, can you hear me? So I became uh, convinced over the years that there's an oceans gene. Um, and you know you have the oceans gene if uh, anytime you walk past the ocean or an estuary or a bay, or for that matter, any kind of water, you have this uncontrollable primal urge to jump in and go scuba diving or snorkeling or surfing or something like that. And I first became aware of this when I was traveling uh, on the Rolex Our World Underwater Scholarship in the late 1800s. Um, and I, I met people from Nebraska who had never seen the ocean and went there once and got transfixed and that was it for them. And I met people who grew up right on the crashing uh, surf by the shores and would rather go to the, to the jungles or mountains or, or deserts. Um, so I think there's a gene there somewhere, and I think I have it. That's the uh, nature part. But as we know, there's also nurture. So I grew up in the 60s, and that was a time of great uh, excitement about the oceans and underwater things. Sea Hunt was on television. Mike Nelson, underwater detective. Each week, the scriptwriters had to find a reason why he had to go underwater to solve a crime. He's still solving that crime. Mm -hmm. Is this directional? Jacques Cousteau was in our living rooms. And it's hard to imagine now, uh, but you see how often people refer back to Jacques Cousteau because it was in living color, it was in your living room, and virtually everything you saw was brand new and with fresh eyes. James Bond got into the act with the, the hit movie, A Thunderball, which, among other things, educated us on some of the perils of, of scuba diving, which I'll show you in a second. The perils of scuba diving. And it was a time of uh, thinking about humans under the sea, and the future was going to be people living under the sea. In the 1970s, there were over 70 underwater operating habitats across the planet. Today, um, as we were talking with Andrew, the answer a few months ago was one, and currently it's zero with Aquarius currently out of, of action. So there's been a huge transformation. That's how I grew up. But fast forward to today, society has moved on and found a new breed of ocean explorer. Some of you may be familiar. I don't know how he got in there. He wasn't supposed to. We want a serious underwater explorer. There we go. <laughs> Mandatory disclaimer. I'm saving you the one of the squirrel on water skis, which is my personal favorite. But in terms of underwater explorers, there are great role models. Sylvia Earle, who's actually an alum of, of Duke. Um, Joe McGinnis, an uh, underwater um, explorer, physician, scientist. And what do these folks have in common? They're world-class scientists. They're really poets and stewards of the ocean. But they're also amazing teachers. Um, and they would be so happy to think about this kind of a group getting together and thinking about the future and how we can solve all these problems and make for a better world. So a big theme tonight, uh, and for, the, for tomorrow as well, is technology. And technology has a long and distinguished involvement in the oceans. Uh, in 1960, uh, Don Walsh and Jacques Picard went in what is essentially uh, like a hot air balloon, the Trieste, the Bathyscap Trieste, to the deepest point of the ocean, the Mariana Trench. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to why that mission happened? Andrew probably knows. Sputnik. So the idea that the Russians could launch uh, something into space was, was such a shock to the system that a call went out to the West Coast to say, we've got to find something big, imaginative, bold. Go find the deepest part of the ocean and go dive there. So 
So that happened in 1960. And if you follow that thread for the next number of years, the technology, the exploration, so much of it came from the government and from the military. And if you look at the development of Woods Hole or Scripps or the big institutions, so much of what happened um, really happened through those channels. So fast forward, believe it or not, while all those things happen in space, the next time that someone went to the bottom of the Mariana Trench was in 2012, 50 years later, James Cameron, the same James Cameron who did Avatar and Titanic and all those things, uh, went to the bottom of the Mariana Trench again. He did it with different technology. He did it with a different context. He did it with a fresh set of eyes. He did it with very different financing, which is the thing that I'm trying to, to point to. But the one thing that was uh, very similar, by the way, um, was that curiosity and wonderment about the oceans, and especially the deep oceans. So there's a transition that's going on in ocean exploration. The universities, the governments will always be uh, incredibly important, but there's a transition that really mirrors what's going on in space as well. If you look at the new generation, you have NASA and the Air Force, but they're cooperating with Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, um, Richard Branson, and sometimes it's partnerships, but it's a shifting model, and the oceans are going under that same kind of transition. So how are we going to finance all these things? Because there are so many incredible technologies. There's, there's basically one person's submarines that you wear. These are David Gruber's squishy fingers, so you can pick up deep sea life without destroying it. The Aleutia, you may have heard of Ocean X, the, the Dalios Enterprise. They're coming out with a newer, bigger ship they designed with James Cameron that's going to be a, a floating media platform and is really going to be a CUSO 2.0. Edie Witter and Deep Sea Observations, or Eye in the Sea Project, to, to try to observe life without disturbing it. Things like bioluminescence. I'm going as fast as I can. Necton submarines, which are going, you may have heard Ali Steeds, is going to the Indian Ocean to go down and explore all those mid-level oceans from a couple hundred meters down to uh, way down, thousands of meters down, because that's an unexplored part that is a huge amount of biomass, biodiversity, and fresh discoveries for all of us. And as an example, not that long ago, when I was with Joe McGinnis in the Arctic, um, you couldn't find ships like this. This is the, the Erebus and Terror, which were Sir John Franklin's ships were lost for hundreds of, excuse me, 150 plus years, and people had no idea how to find them. And now the technologies are such that you can find them, image them, do all these sorts of things. So that's what interests me, is thinking about all these opportunities. And this is just a, a handful of technologies, but there's so many fantastic things happening, many of them here at Duke, many of them at the Nicholas School, the engineering school, and finding ways to finance those where possible making them commercially viable or public-private partners, public -private partnerships. Um, those kinds of initiatives are an important part of this whole design process we're talking about. So I'm really thrilled to be involved in it. I thank you for having me. I look forward to participating tomorrow. Thank you, Ted. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Winnie Lau. Uh, Winnie has a background in oceanography and received her PhD from um, the University of Washington. Uh, she currently works at Pew Charitable Trust and leading their uh, ocean plastic campaign. Thank you, Virginia. So I definitely have the uh, ocean gene that Ted was just talking about. I've always loved the ocean. Uh, I remember a day when I was six years old and at the beach, I was armed with my inflatable lifesaver and I charged full steam ahead into the water to see how far I could go. Of course, I, my lifesaver and I were no match for the waves. The ocean swallowed me under, tumbled me about, and luckily spit me back onto the sand. And instead of fear, I got up and thought that was pretty amazing. And that was my first memory of the awe I feel for the ocean. And I'd like to tell you that I haven't been tempted by other pursuits. Reality kind of has a way of kind of pushing against our passions. Uh, like many of you, when I was a student uh, at UC Berkeley, I was agonizing over which major I should declare. I was all ready to declare engineering, which is one of the best majors on campus. 
But a chance encounter with one of my former classmates landed me on the wait list for the Biology 1B class. Uh, it was an 8 a.m. class in a 500-person lecture hall, one of the largest on campus. And let me tell you, I am not a morning person, not at all, not by a long shot. But I was home. I was really happy. So as you will experience in your own life, um, after graduation, I, I came across many opportunities. But no matter what, the ocean always called to me. The one passion that threads all of my choices has been my love of the ocean. And I'm very fortunate today that I have found a career that bridges science and policy to help protect the ocean I love. Fast forward to today, unlike the pristine scene you just saw, this scene of a plastic-strewn beach is becoming all too common. Plastic has even been found in the deep sea. So how did we get here? So to date, 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic, plastic has been produced. Less than 9% of that has been recycled. About 60% of that is in the environment, and of course, some in landfills, but some also in our forests, in our rivers, and in our oceans. Today, about up to 13 million metric tons of plastic enters our ocean each year. To get, put that into perspective, that's about one garbage truck worth of plastic going into the ocean per minute. And that adds up to over half a million garbage truck load of plastic entering the ocean on an annual basis. So what do we need to do about this? Um, my organization, the Pew Charitable Trusts, has taken a holistic approach to solving our plastic problem, our global plastic problem. We believe that there is no silver bullet, no single solution. Rather, we need them all. We need more recycling. We need the single-use plastic bans. We need better waste management. We need su to substitute and invent new materials. And we need innovation and new technology. The key is to, put, the key is to work together and to figure out how best to put all of these solutions to work so that we can get the biggest bang for the buck and accelerate the changes we need. So we are working with, closely with governments, industry, scientists, and other uh, nonprofit organizations to better understand this global problem and offer solutions. Our approach is two-pronged. First, we will conduct two new analyses to help support better decision making. The global economic analysis will develop a model to assess the costs and mitigation potential of different scenarios for reducing plastic input into the ocean. The global policy analysis will examine the policy options that are available at the local, national, and international levels. With these two analyses in hand, we will bring together a group of experts who will make recommendations and create a global roadmap that will help reduce the amount of plastic entering our ocean. And our plan is to make all of this work freely available to spur and inspire action and investments so that we can reduce the amount of plastic into the ocean. My vision for our future is that we can reduce the amount of plastic, reduce plastic pollution uh, as quickly as possible so that we can return our beaches and our oceans to the pristine state that compelled six-year-old me to run head on into the ocean and be embraced by its beauty. And I really look forward to working with many of you tomorrow to come up with these new and innovative solutions to help protect our ocean. Thank you. All righty. Well, thank you to all of our panelists for being here. Um, I'm really excited, and we'll go ahead and jump into the questions. 
Um, so my first question is, the, um, well, as we all know, our oceans face lots of really big problems from climate change and habitat loss to overfishing and pollution. My question is, how do we decide which of these problems to tackle? And how do we balance, like, I guess, kind of putting out fires, you know, those immediate crises, and balance that with long-term sustainability? <laughs> Anyone? We're very polite. <laughs> We're very polite. I, I guess my, um, or, what comes up for me for that question is that I think every, like we're a big community, you know, I mean, we need to be bigger, more inclusive, but everybody has their passion. And so like what, what area you're drawn to, that's gonna be probably what you're best at doing. So like if a problem draws you, then go for that because probably a different problem that also needs to be addressed, well, somebody else will be drawn to that. So I think it's about following your passion, what you are drawn to, and then making the teams to be able to see the bigger picture collectively. We've been doing the last few years at the Explorers Club uh, a World Oceans Week together with the UN. And I've been around the oceans a pretty long time, so I thought I sort of knew or knew of um, a lot of the folks who were doing things. And I was absolutely blown away by how many organizations um, there are and how many different things they're doing. And you know, it's kind of a common thing now to say, well, wouldn't it be good if people joined forces and worked together? And the more I've thought about it, um, I, I think you really need both lenses. Um, there are people who are passionate, who are doing things that's, you could call it a startup, you could call it a one-person show, you could call it a, a small thing that they really care about. Um, and honestly, for those, I say, let, let a thousand uh, flowers bloom. And if you try to over-manage that, you, you run the risk of killing that creativity. I would say the other lens, though, um, is the case where for some of these huge problems, like the dimensions of what Winnie was discussing uh, with respect to plastics or carbon more broadly in terms of its impact on the oceans and our planet, um, I do think it's also good to get behind some things that scale. So maybe it's almost as we go through our lives, whether it's your day job or our day jobs or our, our philanthropy or the things we do in our spare time, you know, finding things, number one, that, that have the passion to them, but also looking for a combination of teaming up. And uh, as one organization put it, it's being um, radically um, cooperative with others to try and join forces and tackle these, these huge issues. Yeah, so I think, you know, we can draw a lot of lessons from disturbance ecology. Um, and, you know, one of the big stories in, in that field is that diversity is resilience. So the more different ways there are to approach the problem, the more people are looking at different challenges, the more likely we are to find unexpected solutions as well. Um, and you know, there is, a, there is to some extent a triage model in conservation because there are some very, very big problems. And if we don't do something about climate change, a lot of what else we're doing is not gonna make a ton of difference. But if we do do something about climate change, but we haven't fixed any of these other problems, there's not gonna be anything to come back to. Um, so, you know, having a very wide base and allowing people to f pick their problems and figure out what needs to be done, I think is really the only model that has the potential to work. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, the plastic space is actually a space that has many, many players and actors in it. Um, and Pew uh, you know, has joined these many forces because we recognize that there is no too many. Um, we need everyone. And in terms of solutions, there, I think you need the short term, you need the mid term, and then you need the long term. It isn't about choosing one or the other. You, we need all of them and we need, we need everyone to engage. Awesome. Um, this kind of leads, and you, or you got my, I guess, like brain thinking about um, another question, which is how do you form these teams? How do you form these teams of like diverse minds from different backgrounds that are interdisciplinary and also full of passionate people that want to work on your project? How do you how do you rally people to like join you? I guess if that makes sense. I think people key off a few things. Um, one is, is there 
a mission and a backbone to it that, that resonates with them. So if you, if you start with that, I think um, the, the inclusive element of what you're doing and recognizing that there are many parts, we were talking about the role of art and communication and climate change that complements the science and all comes together. If you limit yourself to one uh, aspect of things and you don't embrace the diversity of the different disciplines, um, I think you're limiting yourself. And I think people, people sense that. They have a sense that this is an inclusive area where my contribution can be um, merited and, and noted. Um, and I think that's one of the keys to a attracting people, but then importantly, retaining them and having them continue with their excitement. That said, I think there's also, um, it really helps to take on, take on problems in manageable sizes and deploy them as quickly as possible because that deployment ups the stakes for everyone involved, makes it that much more, um, uh, I guess, interesting uh, and, uh, and frankly, inspiring for them. Um, and frankly, that's when you actually meet the problems. And then once they're involved in solving the problems, then they're hooked. Yeah, I would add just yeah, speaking up about what you're passionate about and then getting that word out there with whoever you're working with. Um, and if it's something that they don't agree with, they're going to go away. And the people who do agree that you can work well with are going to be attracted to you. So it really starts with just um, being who you are and speaking up about that. And then you'll, I think the right teams will can, you know, find themselves self-organized. <laughs> and not to point out the obvious, but hosting an ideation workshop is a really good way to do that. <laughs> so that brings me to our next question. So here at Blueprint, we're really combining, I guess, the oceans um, and innovation here at this conference. And in our current day and age, we have so many more technologies available, um, just like everywhere. Um, how do you think innovation can be used to make advances in marine conservation? I think this gentleman here is one of the fantastic examples of it. Um, and I realize it's not exactly the ocean, but you know what? The ocean is all connected, flat. and they're all, they're all connected one way or another in, in these cycles. So um, that kind of innovation of not having to feel like you have to invent everything the same way at the same time, and to, be, um, to take technologies that are out there and to reapply them and use fresh insights and fresh enthusiasm and inspiration, I think, is... Uh, is a, is a tremendous catalyst for that. I think working through people helps a lot too. So like our, our technology is useless if there, if there aren't people there to actually use it. And I can't go in the forest and tell somebody not to cut it down, only they can. Uh, same is true for oceans to a you know, much like greater degree because uh, it's almost like the global commons. Um, and so, you know, it's hard to think about, it's hard to sort of fathom how big the oceans are, you know, generally plus, you know, something like ocean plastics, it spreads everywhere. So working from the places where the people are, mm -hmm building solutions that helps individuals, and then uh, scrolling out from there is the way to go, I'd say. Yeah, um, going off of what um, Topher said, one of the things we need in um, ocean plastic is monitoring. Um, we don't even know where exactly what's in the ocean, where they are, how they got in there. I mean, we have general ideas, but we don't have a good map of where things are. So one of the... Uh, key needs uh, to solve a problem is you, you need to understand the problem first. So technology can really help you get some of that information so that you, you know what you can do and what you should do. Do you think there's any like particular other fields that we like as like an environmental field can look to and like kind of adopt some of their technologies and like repurpose them or like just kind of like they have similar problems and have solved them in X, Y, Z way that we can, I guess, like harness? Let's see. Yeah, I, I mean, all you, I, would, I would just look to, what, what are the fishermen using? Like, what's, what's technology they use and rely upon? Because chances are you can adapt that to, and people have, uh, to, to actually really make a difference. What's the, what are, what are like the real battle-tested solutions that work out there? Um, I'm sure smartphones are one of them, but there's probably quite a few others that, uh, that don't, they don't even consider to be technology, or we wouldn't consider to be technology, but uh, you know, already part of the play. Yeah. One of the regions that's really ripe, I think, for, for digging into that is agriculture. Um, 
you know, we, we overlook exactly how incredibly technologically advanced modern agriculture is right now, but, you know, they really pioneered monitoring via drone. Um, you know, the first ecologic drones were not monitoring wetlands or tracking whales, they were uh, monitoring the growth rate of corn in the Midwest, and that's really where a lot of the technology for looking at primary production came from. Um, you know, today, still, the largest operator of autonomous vehicles in the world is not um, Tesla or uh, Ford or Uber or Google, it's John Deere. John Deere makes autonomous tractors that, um, you know, the first time you, you see one of these things, you'll be blown away. They're uh, miles ahead of anything we have on, on the roads. And so looking, looking towards things like agriculture, where they really have massive investments in technological development, automation, I think, is a really fruitful place to begin. Yeah, but I had no idea that agriculture was the biggest like autonomous vehicle user. That's really cool. One um, farmer can drive 40 tractors on a farm in Iowa and harvest hundreds of thousands of acres in a day. It's unbelievable. Wow. This kind of leads me to thinking about, so in agriculture, there's kind of clear economic incentive, like farmer, produce more corn, get more money. The ocean's slightly different topic that we're dealing with. How do you think we can work to align like benefits for the environment with benefits for investors, um, and like I guess align those interests so that those parties can work together um, to like see this kind of like amazing uh, ocean progress take place? Um, I can start by saying that at least for plastics, um, the estimate is that it costs us globally $13 billion in damage, and it's probably an underestimate um, due to impacts on tourism, on fisheries, on our water, on, um, may, and this doesn't even account, um, the, take into account the impacts on health. Uh, one, one of the things we wanted to do is to really understand the economics when our, in our economic modeling, so then we can start identifying where in the system we need innovation. because. Innovation in the right places can probably make a huge impact on the entire system. But if you have it in the wrong place, maybe the investment and the return on investment wouldn't be as great. So part of really, like understanding an entire system can really help you understand where your needs are. One of the challenges of, of the oceans is, um, for those of you familiar with the phrase, um, tragedy of the commons, there's this idea that um, if you were to go um, help a coral reef, um, someone has to pay for that one way or another. Um, but what's the return to the people who put that, that money out? And that's, that's one of the, that philanthropy can handle that or governments can handle that. Um, but coming up with an imaginative way to engage um, is, it takes some more work. And Nature Vest had a recent um, deal that they were working on um, and, and Mexico, where they basically brought together, you know, coral reefs provide um, incentives for tourism. They present, uh, prevent storm damage. So they put together a consortium of insurers and local authorities and operators uh, to put together a model where they're actually, everybody got something out of it. That's an example of public-private. There are ones that, are, that could really be done for financial return, like there's a sustainable fishery roll-up that's happening now in South America, where people are finding, uh, this company's finding the best practice places and bringing them together and trying to give them scale and help them grow. That's a more, that's a more pure financial return model. And there's a whole continuum in there. None of them have to be the right answer. Back to the silver bullet question, um, you can really employ a lot of those. But I would say to really get at the scale that you need, whether it's to accomplish the UN Sustainable Development Goals or to fix some of these, these giant intractable problems, um, you are going to need more and more commercial solutions that somehow find a return um, to the capital that goes in, because um, the numbers are just so large. I think also like to, it's the way you sort of think of oceans as well. So we try to, try to draw a distinction between like farmland and oceans. but. Farm, the, the oceans themselves could be very fertile and they could be used for growing all sorts of products um, that don't, don't have to necessarily hurt them either. Whether algae farming, you guys know much more about this than I do, but um, we think of them as an extractive sort of source, you know, it's almost like hunter gatherer on a huge scale, uh, but we could be using oceans to grow things in a sustainable way too. 
there's this great project that I don't know enough about either, but basically it's, uh, it's an algae they can grow in the ocean, and when they put it into uh, feed for cattle, it reduces their methane emissions by some extraordinary percentage, like 70, 80 uh, percent. That would be a huge impact on climate change, but someone has to grow it, so invest there, I guess. <laughs> Okay. Um, I guess, Ted, you kind of mentioned one example that was working, I guess, some on the local level. And I was curious how, I guess, the ocean's interesting in that it's really big and yet also there's local communities. Uh, what is the importance and, I guess, some of the tactics that can be used to engage local communities in their own oceans? We were talking about this um, earlier. I've, over the last number of years, I've been exposed more to the UN and their programs, and I've become a big believer in what they call capacity building, which is basically um, no, no matter how long term you think you're thinking, um, there is probably not going to be long term enough. And to really invest and do the spade work and the shovel work so that longer term you have a solid foundation. So these programs that you put in place, uh, the sand doesn't shift and they go away. Because just a, a few things um, can really change landscape. Just the example, a simple one we're using of you know, Aquarius Lab is down in, in the Florida Keys and a storm comes and all of a sudden it totally changes the future trajectory of that, of, of that program and all the effort that has to go into it. And there's a parallel idea when people say, well, let's, let's do ecotourism or let's set up these things. There are many, many examples of things that were set up with the absolute best intentions and with a long term in mind, but for whatever reasons, things happen in the interim. And it could be nature, it could be hazards, it could be economic duress. Um, but I've, I've become, um, that's why I say a little bit on the side of the, the projects that are intense and local and hands on are fantastic, but also spending some energy on these large scale programs that really think on the long, long term so that these programs endure. There's a lot of communities across Hawaii who over the past couple of decades have been kind of revitalizing their own traditional way of managing the reef, which was really like what happens up Mauka, up the mountain happens in the ocean and it, your home is extends into the ocean. It's not some no man's land out there. It's, it's our home and you take care of it from the mountain to the sea. And so a bunch of communities throughout Hawaii have been implementing their own kind of marine protected areas and protecting them through their ancient knowledge that's been passed down through the generations. And so it's a long process through um, all the legal system and they have to call it this or call it that, but it's really about revitalizing the local knowledge of that place and what that place needs and taking care of it in their way. They make the rules, they want, they want to protect this fish, they want to protect it at this size, they want to protect this area because it's a nursery, and so each place has its own um, kind of wisdom with it, and the people who have lived there generation after generation know that wisdom and, and are, are the caretakers. So I think Hawaii is a really beautiful example of that, of local, local impacts, local communities standing up for their area you know, they're not going to do a huge something, but they want to take care of their area. Okay. Um, I guess on the contrary uh, to that, how do we involve people um, in ocean conservation that are nowhere near the ocean at all, like in a landlocked state or have never even seen the ocean? Or, like, how do we engage those people that don't know anything about it to start? I actually think Open ROV is a fantastic example of that, right? I don't, maybe you want to say a little bit more about the, the, the network and how that evolves. Yeah, so one of the things you can do with Open ROV is um, they have telepresence capabilities, which allows you, if you have a solid internet connection, you can connect the robot to the internet and allow a student somewhere else in the world to then connect to the robot and control it. It's, it's a lot like what the Jason project was doing in the 90s and early 2000s, but on a much uh, smaller scale, but at the same time a much more distributed scale. There wasn't, there's not one robot that you have to go and connect to. There's thousands of robots all around the world that uh, in the very near future there will be the potential for people to connect into. 
So I think giving people opportunities to connect to the ocean is, is really important and really valuable. I think it's, it's also worth thinking about, you know, we don't necessarily have to drag everybody into the ocean um, to get people to care about the world. Um, you know, one of the big problems is even if we solve every great environmental problem we're currently facing, um, tourism is still a massive impact in, in, the, in the world reefs. Um, you know, everyone wants to go see the Great Barrier Reefs. If there's ways to um, maybe allow people to have experiences um, sharing some of that joy of the ocean without necessarily saying, okay, everyone in the world has to come and see uh, this piece of reef. Everyone in the world should. You know, it's, it's like the national parks. Everyone in the world doesn't have to go see Yosemite. Uh, there are certainly people who do and who want to, and that's fantastic. And we should make sure that everyone who wants to see these things have the capability to. But, you know, we shouldn't necessarily assume that everyone shares that same value and needs to share that same value to be connected to the world and to care about the future health of our planet. Oceans are still the most mysterious part of our planet in so many great ways, so uh, that's always going to be imaginative, you know, whether, it's, whether it's books written hundreds of years ago or people looking at it now. Um, the unknown and that sort of frontier, not to discover or conquer it, but just to know that there's things out there, that's, that's pretty great. Also, speaking of open ROV, I've got to give a shout-out to David Lang, really great guy who not only invented open ROV, but also invented open explorer. He showed up twice yeah. <laughs> in this presentation. He's everywhere. And that brings in the storytelling. <laughs> storytelling is a great way to, to yeah. get it out there as well. A uh, young guy just made two great contributions to Oceans. Yeah. And then to go on that way, Jonathan uh, started a presentation. She started with those um, incredible images that she had produced herself. Um, we're finding increasingly at, at the Explorers Club, we have 40 public lectures a year and probably a third to at times almost a half of them one way or another touch climate change. And you, you can't have a lecture now and call it climate change and say, two degrees because you'll lose people because they, they get it so um, often and so frequently. So art and the emotional connection, and that's what I think the Dalios are trying to do with Ocean X, and that's what so many different kinds of artists are doing. You're a rare example of combining both things in one human being, which is uh, hats off um, to you. But I, I do think that on the communication side, this, the visceral connection um, is a big deal, and especially for people who are more remote um, from the ocean. I've talked to colleagues um, in other organizations, local organizations who work with communities inland, and we were discussing how could they possibly make it, uh, make the inland communities care about ocean plastic. They don't go there, they may never go there, um, and you know, some of the strategies they told me they use is to connect their life to the ocean via things they actually use, like they consume fish. Um, so you don't have to be the ocean at the ocean to know that it impacts your life. Um, we can talk to them about maybe their potential to go to the beach in the future. So trying to really figure out where people's lives are touched by the ocean, even if not directly, is another way that we can draw them in. But I would say, you know, the images that um, are uh, that will are shown by you know your cameras, your underwater cameras. I mean, those things also draw people a lot. Drew me and um, and my friends and family who are not ocean lovers. They will when I, they see me, because I think if you are uh, an ocean person, all your friends will want to ask you about it. So that's one, one um, perk of being an ocean person. Um, they'll always want to know about whales and dolphins. But um, they'll also ask you when they see something cool, like, hey, what is that? Awesome. Um, I guess we mentioned Jonathan's, I guess, ability to combine art and science and storytelling kind of got me thinking about like different narratives that surround the ocean. So there are some that are, I guess, like kind of boost the ocean up, like, kind of like it's a common heritage type place for like a lot of people or like, um, but on the contrary, there's also, I guess, like a fear of the ocean in some ways, like from movies like Jaws and like, I don't know, like fear of sharks and the unknown and the deep and stuff like that. So I guess I just wanted to ask you guys, are there any narratives about the ocean that you think are particularly like strong 
um, like for or against that kind of benefit or make it seem unattractive? Well, other than the movie The Meg, <laughs> which I actually thought was better than the reviews. Um, but having said that, um, it's interesting. I, I think back a lot to um, the Odyssey and the classics, and it's not an accident that Jason and Argo were named by uh, Bob Ballard after classics because um, that is the notion of uh, exploration and the return. And we have, uh, at our place, we have 200 flags that go all around the world, and you, you check them out if you're doing an expedition, and it's the whole notion that comes right out of the odyssey of the return. And what's important about the return is when you come home from the voyage, and I think this applies to so much of what we all do, is it's one thing to have gone out and done it, um, but it's another uh, to come back and then share and, and make it um, part of the collective consciousness and part of uh, humankind's traditions and progression. So to your point about the narratives in the ocean, I think that, that one, it's uh, the circumnavigations have a way of just gripping people's imaginations. Hokali, uh, uh, the, the navigating by stars and waves all around the world using um, a technology from 800 or 900 years ago those things capture the imagination. And you'll see that next year. You'll get, uh, for those of you who have, don't see it coming, you're going to get a huge dose of uh, Magellan and Elcano um, because it'll be the cinquecentennial of the first circumnavigation of the, of the planet. So I think those big journeys, that is, back to your point about the expansive oceans, um, they lend themselves to this narrative of this huge distance and scale and adventure, but that idea of coming back and sharing and moving forward afterwards. I will add that um, when I talk to friends and, and um, colleagues who work in education and with kids, they have told me that Finding Nemo, the movie, has actually greatly increased um, the awareness and the love of the ocean for children. And so I think we should not um, forget the, those types of stories. The Meg scares people, Let's, we can maybe do encourage more of these positive stories that give people a personal connection to the ocean. Hmm. By the way, uh, Nemo is another version of the Odyssey, too. It's, ah. it's, it's, it's all about the return. Now I have to watch <laughs> the Odyssey, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, Nemo is one of my favorites, too. There's this great online um, uh, sort of, I guess, newspaper, you call it, uh, called Manga Bay, and they do these really great studies. And one of the things they did um, a few years ago was to look at the most effective vectors for conservation overall. Uh, technology and policy, meaning like laws, didn't even crack the top five. But the most effective one overall is superstition. Uh, people don't go destroy forests or don't really mess up places in the ocean that, that uh, they have some sort of theological or superstitious reason not to. Um, similar, I guess, to the, the, um, the cultural history uh, around Hawaii. Uh, so I don't know, sort of bringing those things out, explaining why places are important. Um, or in some cases, just start some rumors about, about areas. That, <laughs> Um, so I'm not quite sure how to use that, but uh, <laughs> it's empirical at least. The deep ocean is haunted. Yeah. <laughs> no, but there, I mean, there is value as well, and you know, the inspirational stories are tremendous, but we also don't necessarily need to shy away from the scary stories or the weird stories. You know, Jaws is probably a perfect movie. It is an incredible piece of cinematic art, and it got a lot of people terrified about sharks, but it also really kick-started the entire shark conservation movement. It got a lot of people thinking a lot about sharks. And some of those people thought, I'm never going anywhere near the ocean again because there's giant sharks off the, off the coast. And some people thought, wow, sharks are the coolest thing I've ever seen. I need to go see a real one and not a giant rubber one. Uh, so, you know, those kinds of stories can be really powerful and really captivating. Um, one of my favorite recent examples of this is um, Last year, um, in the Pacific Northwest, there was a truck full of hagfish that tipped over, and it slimed a bunch of cars behind it, and it slimed a ton of the highway, and the pictures that came out of it are unbelievable, because hagfish, um, in addition to being just an incredibly weird animal, produce 
unimaginable amounts of slime when they're stressed out. And it is just these phenomenal pictures. And there was this whole kick around of people just being like, what is this thing? Why is it in a truck in the Pacific Northwest? How is it producing all this slime? How do I get it off of my clothes? And did it really just swallow an entire Prius in a wall of slime? <laughs> and those stories are powerful too. They really help people connect to something that like, most people in their lives would never even imagine thinking of a hagfish. And now there's a whole community of people who are just like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And it all came from a truck tipping over full of hagfish. That, to be clear, is not the odyssey. <laughs> it's a great story, though. I'm curious about hagfish now. Like, I want to like hold one now. <laughs> um, it will produce a lot of slime. <laughs> a hagfish can fill a five-gallon bucket with slime almost instantaneously. What? Where does it come from? <laughs> um, okay. Um, on to the next question. Um, so, there's a lot of, I guess, big challenges uh, surrounding our oceans, and a lot of big players. So, governments, NGOs. Uh, private industries, academics, um, all have a stake in these problems. And I guess my question is, is what do you see as the biggest challenge in breaking the status quo? And I guess how the practices that got us to where we are, um, what do you see as the biggest, I guess, barrier to that? I mean, there could be multiple, of course. Um, and I guess how do we break through them? The, the thing that I feel I hear most frequently is um, sense of urgency. And um, you know, it's, it's hard because there, there have been people who have been saying for decades, in fact, there have been some articles of um, things stretching back into the 70s and 80s of people warn, warning on climate. And so that's decades and decades. And how do you sort of break through and have that, that consciousness at a societal level that says, no, 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 we, we really have to do this now. I will say that in the last um, couple of years, it has felt like there's been some real momentum building. And I think it's because of the great work of people like on this, um, people up here tonight. Um, but I really think that's, that's the thing. Um, as uh, president of the Union of Concerned Scientists recently said, uh, we have the tools, what we need is the will. That's really well put, Ted. Um, I think the approach we take is to try and form as many partnerships as possible um, and to have dialogue, to, to make sure you have dialogue with people in uh, other sectors um, so that you are not only kind of speaking to the choir so that you can really go and understand the other perspectives. Because at least in my own experience, if you have these dialogues, you will find common ground. And then that's where you build from so that you can figure out ways to work together. I think oceans mean very different things to different people, even within society. So the oceans uh, is, is like an industry for a lot of people. And that's something that you have to work with. For other people, it's an area of conservation. I remember you brought up Sylvia Earle earlier on. I remember uh, seeing her have a conversation with somebody um, between the audience and the stage, she was watching him give a talk, and he was talking about how to uh, engage the lobster industry in protecting uh, areas in the North Atlantic. Uh, and she was like, "Lobsters aren't a product; they're an animal. They're a beautiful, they're a beautiful animal to be uh, to be protected and respected." Uh, and I had trouble disagreeing with either of them, frankly. Uh, but both of them are working hard to protect oceans. So, yeah. having said that, if you ever have Sylvia Earle for dinner, don't serve fish. <laughs> <laughs> Very strong in that. She's met them once. Yeah. I guess an, a question going off of that is how do we get people that uh, have these like drastically different ideas of like and opinions on a topic, like to come together and have those productive dialogues instead of being like really insular and just talking to the people that they know who have the same opinions as them, and then it just kind of like they form a really strong group, and then you have on the other side, a really strong group, but how do we get those two groups to come together in a productive way? I guess if they're b both agreeing for 
they're fighting up uh, on one level, but both can see a common vision, like in your example, um, with the lobsters and, and um, pres preserving the ocean, it's both for, we both want healthy lobster populations, but one of them wants to eat them too. <laughs> but if you go to the other level above that, that you both want healthy lobster populations, healthy oceans, then maybe they can work towards that goal, even though there might be conflict on one level. Yeah, I think there's, there's wisdom in that. There's a, an old adage, when you're dealing with conflict, uh, attack the problem, not the person. Um, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of energy now going into trying that. In fact, there's a, there's a green tea party that's, a, that's an offshoot of the, the tea party. Um, and they are basically have aligned with environmentalists. They don't do it ideologically by sitting at podiums and debating each other, but they find common issues where they are, are in agreement. Even if they don't have the precise same philosophical underpinnings, they can agree on what's a good outcome. And it could be about utilities, which it was in one example in Florida, where they actually had the, the, same, the same goal in mind, which is what you're saying is seek those common areas of understanding, um, but also action, uh, and you can build trust by doing that over time. Okay, um, and I guess kind of, I guess along similar lines, so for example with the lobsters, how do we, or I guess it doesn't have to be about lobsters specifically, but um, how do we, I guess, get these baselines and measure progress in the ocean when it is like such a large thing? And what have, methods have you seen that have worked for like, in terms of baselines and uh, like, I guess, chronological measurements to see like if progress has been made or not. And I, I guess contrary to that, you can also list examples where you have seen like failures in measurement leading to failures in outcome. Well, this is what you do, right, Jonathan? Like you're, you're trying to establish a baseline for deep yeah. sea ecology in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So a first step, establish the baseline and then be able to monitor change. So, but this is like a, a huge goal, so we're taking it step by step. Um, but in coral reefs, actually, I can connect that to Nemo, <laughs> because on the west coast of Hawaii Island is very big industry uh, for um, aquarium fishing. Uh, so much so that local people got very angry because they're taking out all the fish, and so there was a huge conflict along the west coast of Hawaii Island, and so. There's a long-term monitoring they established. They work, you know, work together and pick these um, a, a network of protected areas that they were say, okay, here is no fishing, no aquarium fishing. We're going to let the populations rebound. And so there's this great program. The Division of Aquatic Resources have done this monitoring program where um, every month they'd visit each site along that coast, and there's a um, it's kind of a paired, so you have inside and outside of the reserve, and by monitoring over, I don't know, 15 years or so, they were able to document that inside the reserves, the populations rebounded, the aquarium fish uh, rebounded. Also outside the reserve they did because, or right around because of the spillover, whereas where they're fishing it stayed the same. So they're able to demonstrate that these, these protected areas, even though they're small, because they're networked, they, they do work. So that's an example of uh, measure, like really good measurement over a long period of time that was able to demonstrate success. And there's another uh, marine protected area that was <laughs> demonstrated a failure. <laughs> so it was because people couldn't agree on the exact, um, they didn't come to an agreement. I guess the, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm losing my words right now. There, um, the compromise, that's the word I'm looking for, the compromise was to protect, to do kind of like a cycling marine protected area off of Diamond Head on Oahu, where it's, this area is closed for a year and then it's open for a year. So they thought they'll just do this time cycling thing. So they also measured that and what happens is the area is closed, the populations start to rebound, but then as soon as they open it, all the fishermen and women are standing on the shore waiting to go out and they pound the, the fish and then it's the same. So that's an example of where it, that protection mechanism didn't work. But 
Um, so those are the two just examples from Hawaii. But yeah, we definitely need the baseline measurement in order to see how it's working. With that in mind, I don't think like measurement starts, starts now. I mean, there's, whether it be me or any of the rest of us, a lot of us are thinking about new ways to collect new data. But like, as you brought up earlier on, you know, there's decades, if not hundreds of years worth of data that's already out there that can be shared and made available. Um, at the event tomorrow, I don't know how much, how much of the innovations people come up with will be about something they build, but if you just sit there and analyze data that's available, you can learn a lot about the oceans. Um, you guys know a lot about that, I'm sure. I think one of the real challenges with talking about establishing baselines now is that we're already starting from a highly altered position, and it's been highly altered for two, three, four hundred years in some areas. If you go to the Chesapeake Bay, um, you know, our records don't go back before the 1600s, and if you read the reports then, there are already discussions of declining oyster populations and shifting baselines, and so it becomes very challenging to say what the healthy level is when we don't really have any kind of vision of what that could have been. And I think a, a fruitful place that um, I certainly haven't even begun to look into, but someone who's doing something very, very clever with, with AI and machine learning might be able to, is to look into um, literary baselines. So to go through, um, not scientific records, but literary records, um, how people talked about environments um, when they wrote poems 2,000 years ago and seeing if there's not a way to pull data out of that kind of uh, documentation. I, I don't have an example of um, monitoring that works, and I fully endorse all of these uh, <laughs> ideas. I, I will share why it's important. Um, so two, two examples. One, in the plastics work, as we're doing our economic analysis, we have discussed uh, a lot within the group, like, what is our target? And we realized without enough understanding of the issue, we couldn't even say what our target is. So, so we have to do our analysis differently. But if we had a target, we, if, we say, if, we, if we could say we want to reduce plastic pollution by 90% by this year, then we can do our analysis that way. Um, so, so monitoring and having data is, uh, are really important things. And then second, um, from a policy perspective, when you put a policy in place, people, um, the citizens, the government officials who put their political capital behind something, they want to be able to say, this is what happened when we put the policy in place. This is the positive impact we had. So it's really important to figure out how to get the baseline information, how to keep monitoring. Um, the improvements to the environment based on you know, what actions have been taken. Well, it comes to plastics, what are some of the great ways, some of the good ways to monitor? It's like so insidious because it's, it's hard to see. Yeah, no, um, there's a group in California called Five Gyres. They've been doing expeditions out into the gyres to you know, collect information. So there are groups like that. Um, there are some groups that are trying to capture uh, plastic at the river mouth to see what's there. There's um, another group that's doing what they are calling uh, brand audits to actually take the plastic trash that they have gotten and look at which companies made the plastic so that they can start, start saying who is responsible for this and make them accountable. The so collecting they, fingerprints next to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are some groups that are thinking about um, how do you put, like, DNA mark, um, you know, put DNA marking, like, things on fishing nets, you know. Can you put something on fishing nets so that when um, they find it in the environment, they can figure out whose it was or who made it so that they can then go back to those manufacturers and users and say, hey, you need to do better. And to Andrew's point, there are also ways to look backward, to look forward. So there have been, um, recently, there's the drilling in the Antarctic, Antarctica where really the, is the, the, the front line of, of the whole climate um, issue um, based on all the dynamics and the way it feeds into the, the natural systems of the planet. Um, but they can go back hundreds of thousands of years and they can find out what the CO2 levels are and back out the temperatures. And it's an incredible data set that they have. And in fact, there's a gentleman 
who did an ice core in the Alps. And then to your, to your point, uh, Andrew, he went back into the, um, the monasteries and studied um, manuscripts from the time and is able to plot um, what everything um, looked like over time. And for instance, he recreated um, during the time of the plague in Europe, you can just see what happened. Industrial production went down, carbon went down, uh, the earth, literally Europe, cooled. So I do think um, there, some of them are sad developments. When the ice recedes and permafrost melts, you can have access to, to new sets of data. It's not necessarily good news, but there, I think the, these techniques that are out there will allow people to take use of the data sets that are already out there and have pretty long duration, which is what scientists are looking for. Andrew and Ted, your stories jogged a memory for me. I, I once met a scientist that used historical pictures of um, fishermen's trophy fish, hmm. and they used that to analyze the change in size of fish over time. Um, you know, the, the premise is that uh, as we fish more and more, had more and more f fishing pressure, the size of the fish that people caught and took pictures with got smaller and smaller. Okay, um, this is our last question, um, which is basically um, about, I guess in this world where we hear about all the like sad ocean stories, like, oh, the Great Barrier Reef is dead, our oceans are dying, stuff, headlines like that. What motivates you, inspires you, and gives you hope to do your work? And what advice would you give to students in the audience or anyone in the audience, really, that um, wants to, I guess, pursue ocean conservation or like do something to help our oceans? Well, for, for me, it's um, learn as much as you can. And by the way, that, that applies, uh, I think, through your whole life. I still feel like there are topics where I'm brand new and know absolutely nothing, which is actually most things. But it's, it's um, having that um, constant curiosity and wanting to absorb as much as you can. And then the second part is like do something, um, comma, anything. And back to where we started the, the evening, uh, there's a lot of problems out there and there's a lot of ways to tackle them, but whatever you know, um, gets you inspired is just go do something and you never know where that trail leads over time. Also, a lot of these problems, if they're, if they're coming from people, they have to be solved by people. So you can find somebody whose problem you're helping to solve and helping them solve that problem, but be a community or a person uh, will affect your sort of outcome. So find those hacks and you'll come out with it. Also, if you tell somebody you're gonna help them solve the problem, you kind of end up having to do it. Um, they're, they're more likely to follow up with you than uh, the ocean itself. What, what inspires me is that um, when we put our minds to doing something, we actually can make a huge difference. Um, I, I, I keep going back to the plastics issue because I'm really immersed in it right now. And you know, a few years ago, nobody really thought about the plastic problem. I, I remember, I can't even remember, even 15, 20 years ago, I started not asking for plastic bags when I went shopping because I was like, I have so many of these. I don't even know what to do with them. I had to go to Ikea to get a plastic thing to put the bags in. I was like, <laughs> that's ridiculous. But fast forward to now, everyone is talking about plastics. Um, I was just at a family vacation and we had a huge conversation with the whole group about plastics. So in in just a few years, even you know, three, four years ago, a lot of people didn't know about the issue. In a short amount of time, when we collectively as a society decide we want to do something, we can put a lot of things into place. And we can do, make a lot of action and have a lot of impact. <laughs> I nope. guess. Oh, sorry. Oh, go go ahead. ahead. No, no, you go first. Okay. Um, so I, what inspires me every day is the beauty that I see. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of that we hear of all the degradation and all these terrible things that are happening. I think we also have to give equal voice to all the wonderful things that are happening and to bring those up and to talk about that and to like keep that going forward too. Um, yeah, just see the beauty and talk about it and share it, be passionate about something and pass it on. Yeah, 
I think it's very easy to be pessimistic about us as a species and our capacity to unleash tremendous destruction on the planet. And there's a kind of a trope of, of thinking of humans as one of the few species that would ever completely destroy its own world, um, which is not actually true. A lot of species are pretty bad at, at managing their world. Certainly the, the cyanobacteria about 200 million years ago did, did not so great things when they produced oxygen. But you know, the one thing I always come back to is that the human race is the only species on this planet that we know of that has actively said and made decisions about protecting parts of the planet that maybe aren't necessarily imminently important to it. We're one of the few species that has ever said, we want to keep another species alive, not because we eat it, not because we need it, but because we like that it exists in this world. And, you know, it gives me hope that we have um, a tremendous capacity to destroy, but also a tremendous capacity to protect and to, to create and to uh, recover. Thank you to all of our panelists and to everyone in our audience that came. Uh, I really look forward to seeing um, these conversations continue tomorrow and the solutions students come up with uh, in their teams. Um, however, it's not, we're not done for tonight. We have a reception in the Bryan Center uh, with desserts and all of our speakers will be there and mentors will be there and all of uh, the DCT team. So please uh, join us in the Bryan Center. You can uh, be directed by people in the teal shirts. They're all volunteers uh, and we hope to see you there. And let's give one big round of applause to our panelists. We're so happy.